Exodus 22.18 famously says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Some, such as the Jewish theologian Maimonides, took the biblical prohibitions on witchcraft to refer to mere illusions and visual tricks rather than truly demonic activity. The Puritans were of an entirely different mind. In response to the question whether the witches of our times be the same with those that are here condemned by Moses' law, William Perkins says, If we do well consider the quality and condition of the witches of our days, we shall easily see that they be the same. For experience shows that whether they be men or women, but especially aged women, they be such persons as do renounce God and their baptism and make a league with the devil, either secretly or openly, in which the devil bindeth himself to teach them certain rites and ceremonies, whereby they may be able to work wonders as to stir up tempests, to reveal secrets, to kill or hurt men and cattle, or to cure and do good according to the tenor of their covenant. The confessions of witches recorded in the chronicles of countries through all Europe do with common consent declare and manifest this point, so that howsoever our witches may differ in some circumstances from those in the time of Moses, as either in the instruments and means used, or in the manner and form, or in some particular ends of their practices, yet in substance and foundation of witchcraft they agree with them. For both of them have made a covenant with the devil one way or another, and by virtue thereof have wrought wonders above the order of nature. Agreeing therefore in the very foundation and form of witchcraft, which is the league and in the proper end the working of wonders, they must needs be in substance and effect the same with the witches mentioned by Moses. In describing witchcraft, Perkins states that Satan initiates a covenant with men who are either notoriously bad persons or very silly souls. He offers such men signs, either books, words of scripture twisted and abused, to the great insult and disgrace of the Lord God, holy or rather unholy water, signs, seals, mirrors, images, bowing of the knee, and other such diverse gestures. When the wicked see these means offered to them, they quickly are not a little glad, and assuredly believe that there is virtue in those things by which to work wonders. Satan, says Perkins, delights in the counterfeiting of God. He is God's ape and takes things upon himself as though he were God. As God has his word, his sacraments, and faith due to him, so the devil has his word, and to seal it to the wicked he annexes certain signs, namely characters, gestures, sacrifices, etc., as it were sacraments, that he may both signify his devilish pleasure to his magicians, and they in return may testify to him their satanical obedience and confidence. He distinguishes between secret and open satanic covenants, the former being an implicit allowance of Satan into one's heart, allowing him to work his magic, whereas the latter is an open and explicit covenant made with him. Magic is either conjectural or operative. Operative magic consists of divination, in which a thing by Satan's direction are prophesied beforehand through means such as flying birds, animal entrails, necromancy in which the devil poses as a dead man to give the witch information, or operative magic, on the other hand, consists of juggling, such as when Pharaoh's magicians transformed their staffs into snakes, and enchantment in which men, but especially young children and men of riper years, are, by God's permission, infected, poisoned, hurt, bound, killed, and otherwise molested. Perkins concludes his description of magic by saying, Surely, if a man but takes a view of all of popery, he will easily see that most of it is mere magic. He then proceeds to ask whether the witches of our age are to be punished with death, and that by virtue of this law of Moses, answering, I doubt not, but in this last age of the world, and among us also, this sin of witchcraft ought as sharply to be punished as in former times, and all witches being thoroughly convicted by the magistrate ought, according to the law of Moses, to be put to death. He gives three reasons for this. Firstly, that the Mosaic Law's ruling on witches stands both now and forever to the world's end. Secondly, that witchcraft is a form of idolatry, which is also a capital offence. And finally, that witches are prone to lead others into idolatry, sin, and death, and as such are a threat to the state. He then gives instructions on how to try those suspected of witchcraft, approving of both questioning and torture methods such as the rack, in which a bed-like open frame is suspended above the ground with the victim's ankles and wrists being secured by ropes that passed around axles near the head and the foot of the rack, 
When the axles were turned slowly by poles inserted into sockets, the victim's knee, shoulder, and elbow joints would be dislocated. However, he condemns the common practice in which the party suspected of witchcraft was brought before the magistrate, who caused red-hot iron and scalding water to be brought, and commanded the accused to put his hand in the one, or to take up the other, or both, and if he took up the iron in his bare hand without burning, or endured the water without scalding, he was then cleared and judged innocent, but if he did burn or scald, he was then convicted and condemned for a witch, with Perkins saying this manner of conviction is to be condemned as wicked and diabolical as in truth it is, considering that thereby many times an innocent man may be condemned and an obvious witch escape unpunished. The Puritans also found the supernatural to be a polemical tool to wield against so-called Sadducees who denied the immortality of the soul, or infidels who denied the existence of God, angels, and demons, as well as a way to strengthen one's own faith in God and the afterlife. With Richard Baxter writing, the certainty of the world of spirits, and consequently of the immortality of souls, of the malice and misery of the devils and the damned, and of the blessedness of the justified, fully evinced by the unquestionable histories of apparitions, operations, witchcrafts and voices, a collection of testimonies from trusted and honest men pertaining to the supernatural. He records what a pious woman, still living in London at the time he wrote, told him of Satan appearing to her in her house while she was suffering from a bout of depression. He came in the form of a large black man and proceeded to point to the top of her door, signalling for her to hang herself for near a quarter of an hour before disappearing when she resisted his command. Another incident took place in the month of April 1652 to Mary, the daughter of Edward Ellens, a child of ten. She and a group of her friends had encountered a woman, Catherine Huxley, then aged about 40 years and rumored to be a witch. The children mocked her and pelted her with stones, prompting the woman to curse the children, looking at Mary specifically and saying, you shall have stones enough. After this, Mary became deathly ill such that her family feared she would not live. She consistently both excreted and threw up stones and black sand. After an examination of Catherine, the purported witch, her house was found to be filled with stones of the same shape and size as those thrown up by the girl. She was promptly executed, prompting the girl's immediate recovery with the number of stones numbering over 80, and Baxter himself being able to see them and hear credible testimonies verifying the event, with hundreds of townsmen affirming its truth. Baxter also relates the story of his friend's brother, a drunkard who, whenever he became sober, would be plagued with sounds of invisible hands rapping on his bedside, his shoes and clothing moving themselves and other supernatural phenomenon, which scared both him and his family who witnessed it also. Bewildered, Baxter asked him how he could continue in his sin after such clear warnings against it, speculating whether this spirit was a demon or the man's guardian angel warning him against sin. One of Baxter's friends, the son of a very godly conforming minister, had found a book on conjuring the devil, and eager to see if it was real, attempted to summon him. The devil instantly appeared, offered him a knife, and urged him to kill himself swiftly, as he would soon have to depart. The man, terrified, fled and informed Baxter, begging for his help. Baxter told him that he had nothing to fear if he earnestly repented and shunned such things in future. He also tells of numerous more stories in which victims of hexes cough up nails, bones, chunks of dog meat, stones, seashells, and pieces of wood, as well as having nails protrude from their skin of demons assaulting people in their homes, of people waking up inexplicably rope-bound, of reports of witches partaking in intercourse with devils, a fact he claims has so wide an ancient testimony that a reasonable man cannot doubt it, citing Saints Augustine, Bernard, and numerous other authorities, both dead and living. He gives the story of Magdalena Crucia, who went to Pope Paul III as a penitent and confessed her sins, that at twelve years old the devil solicited her and lay with her, and that he had lain with her for 30, 30 years. Yet she was made the abbess of a monastery and counted a saint due to her false miracles, such as the Eucharist floating into her mouth performed through the power of Satan. She was subsequently imprisoned for life by the Inquisition. He invokes the witness of the humanist Erasmus, who claims his town was burnt down by a witch. Numerous instances of murdered corpses bleeding afresh, among other things, at the approach of their murderer. 
The famous reformer Philip Melanchthon tells of how his aunt was visited by a Franciscan friar accompanied by a demon, assuming the form of her dead husband. Begging to have masses said for him, he claimed that he would not hurt her, but upon touching his hand, she cried out in pain, receiving a permanent burn mark. He also reports an illiterate peasant woman tortured by demons who accurately prophesied, in fluent Greek, of coming German wars. Zanke, another well-known reformer, reports of not only demons, but fairies and other creatures he claims harass and disturb men. St. Cyprian reports women claiming to perform wonders by the Holy Spirit who were also revealed to be witches. Baxter assures his readers that such credible stories of demons and other spirits shows that the view held by some philosophers that since matter individuates, that is, separates one thing from another, and we will be without matter once we die and are separated from our bodies, that we will then become one soul with no individuation upon death. This foolish worry is refuted by the clear demonic individuals encountered even in this life. To conclude his relation of various credible and well-sourced stories, Baxter says, It is sad that the Sadducean, or rather atheistical denying of spirits, should so far prevail, and sadder that the clear testimonies of so many ancient and modern authors should not convince them. But why should I wonder if those who believe not Moses and the prophets will not believe though one should rise from the dead? He blames this lack of belief in part on absurd court practices which convict and execute non-witches, as well as Roman Catholics who lie to convince people of their false miracles and exorcisms. He tells of a trip to Paris he himself undertook and a visit to a nunnery purported to be the home of a demonically possessed nun. Upon arrival, he immediately suspected the possession and subsequent exorcism of the nuns by priests to be a fake. He asked the Jesuits their permission to speak to the demon in an unknown language, and upon realizing that the nun knew neither Arabic, Latin, or any other language in which Baxter spoke to her, the Jesuit responded that the demons were not well-traveled, to which Baxter laughed. He later learned from other French Protestants that the Jesuits would invent stories of possession in order to accuse Protestants of witchcraft and burn them. To sum up, in the eyes of the Puritans, witchcraft was not only a real evil which proves the existence of the supernatural, but also a great danger which must be actively fought against.